A couple of weeks ago, I promised uh, my analysis of CloudBerry. Um, that CloudBerry is sort of the alternative uh, cloud storage, cloud, CloudBerry backup, uh, which now supports the Amazon Glacier storage, which is so cost effective for any instance where you just want to stuff things up into the cloud and you don't need real-time immediate access to it, which is the case for most backup. Um, we, there wasn't, we already have a solution for the Mac that we've talked about. Um, we didn't have one for, for Windows-based machines. Um, I con got in contact with the CloudBerry guys and got email back from their crypto guy and had a chance to look at it. Now, there's one thing they didn't specify that I have asked about and have not yet received an answer. Everything else, though, they did right. And the question I have, it's not crucial, but I wouldn't, and so I wouldn't be surprised if they did it right. But the bottom line is from Everything I've seen, they did everything right. Um, they use a you, they have a suite of ciphers that the user can choose among uh, AES, uh, triple DES, single DES, or RC2. Now, I, you know, so just choose AES. I'm not sure why anyone. I guess maybe export reasons, or if there was some reason you had to soften it, then you might just use. I mean, no, no one wants to use one DES, maybe, maybe triple. Um, but so you have a choice of ciphers. Um, every single file or portion of a file, in the case, that if, if you use the block level option, gets its own initialization vector. Now, that's important because um, remember that um, in... In it, it, the, the way you encrypt a block of data is not just to encipher each block, e each cipher size, like 128 bits for AES by itself. If you did that, then anytime you enciphered the same 128 bits, you get the same cipher out. And so patterns could be seen. So they solved this problem with, with something called an, a, a cryptographic mode where you, you chain these together. And we'll actually be talking about this a little bit later with regard to the DTLS protocol because this comes into play there. Um, but similarly, you, you don't – if you're going to encrypt multiple blocks with the same key – then the problem is if you encrypt the same data, you'll get the same result in, you know, in terms of like the whole block. So to solve that problem, we use a so-called initialization vector, which can be provided. It doesn't have to be kept secret. It just has to be pseudo-randomly derived and different. So they do that correctly. Um, they also use, uh, they take the user's provided password, which never leaves the user's machine. And so if, what I haven't used yet is the acronym TNO, and they pass. This is fully TNO safe. Trust no one. So they take the user's password. They run it through a 1,000 iterations of an HMAC uh, SHA-1 hash in order to slow down the process of turning the password into the hash. And... They use an 8-byte random um, salt per file. So every file which is hashed under the same password ends up with a different, w with a different and unique encryption key because it, it starts with a random salt, which is mixed in with this, uh, the password key derivation function. So that was done correct. And then with every file... They store the algorithm that was used, the encryption mode that was used, the length of the key that was chosen, which also, by the way, is user settable uh, and configurable, the initialization vector, and then the, the password-based key derivation function used, and the iteration count, and the salt. So, I mean, this is everything you want in what should be done before the data leaves your machine so that 
everything in, be, that's being stored in the cloud is just irreversible pseudo-random noise to any authority, at any entity, bad guys, good guys, anything looking at it. And the only way to make sense of it is to bring it back as it is and then do, do the reverse process that you did on your machine. So um, I've not switched to it, but I think I'm about to. Um, so I will give a, a little more of a user interface features sort of look once I've had a chance to do that. But a number of people have been saying that their 15-day evaluation period or whatever the evaluation period is, is running out, and what should they do? And my advice is this looks like the real deal. I think these guys did it right. The one thing that I mentioned they didn't talk about is something which we're beginning to understand in the security crypto industry is more important than we originally thought. And that is the idea of a message authentication code, or so-called MAC. The idea is that you want to prevent tampering. And so it's one thing to have privacy, but you also want to know that what you get back is exactly what you originally stored. And if you, <clears throat> based on everything I've said so far, somebody could tamper with the with the data. Now, it'd be very difficult for them to do anything useful in terms of tampering, but you would like to know when it comes back that it's it's exactly what it was that you sent. And that requires message authentication to sort of wrap this entire thing. And that's one thing they didn't mention when they gave me their technical readout, but neither did they say they don't have it. So I just I sent back a note saying, hey, what about that? And uh, maybe they don't, which is not a huge problem, but I imagine that it's something that they ought to add if they haven't. So I will uh, I'll update our listeners as soon as I know, but I'm impressed with it. I think they did a good job.